Welcome to the Dividend Talk Podcast, episode 150. What are we doing with 3M? A dive into their settlements. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just getting started, Dividend Talk is the place to be for insights, analysis, and unsalted advice on how to make the most of your money through dividends with our own unique European flavor. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe to our podcast and join our community on Facebook at Dividend Talk. See you on the inside. Hey, European DJ. How are you, my friend? Really, really good. I mean, the summer is starting. You know, the, the weather is nice. And you know what they say always, right? Go, in, go away in May, but remember to come back in September. Of course, I'm not selling my entire portfolio here. The nice, beautiful thing about dividend investing is that you don't care about this. It will continue to, to do well usually during the summers because we buy stable businesses. On the other end, we're talking about the stock today, which is also an evidence that not every stock in our uh, portfolio is maybe uh, the safest, whether it's summer or not, but just in general. But yeah, no, I'm doing well, really looking forward for the summer. How about you? Yeah, we, we have a little bit of a mini heat wave over in Ireland, which is rare. We always get it around this time, exams kind of start, which is good. Our friend Russ has landed in Ireland this week, so he gets to enjoy the beautiful countryside with with this glorious weather so it's it's a nice time of year i'm looking forward to i'm looking forward to some more sunshine and yeah it's nice it's nice it's really relaxing so, so are you telling me that we will see some more red people in ireland oh, definitely yes yes <laughs> I, this this is like the fifth or sixth day of of continuous weather above 20 degrees usually means we're going to have a water shortage in about two or three days we, we, we don't cope too well with it when it's warm but oh, wow. there'll, be, there'll be a lot of people with we call farmers tans so yeah. you'll have like they wear t-shirts so they'll be red yeah. or brown from the the say the sleeve down on their on their t-shirts and then their body will be completely white and they'll have a red face so yeah that <laughs> that'll be a common sight nice nice so hey um you know i i let's get started with the news of the week derek because there's one thing that i really want to talk with you about and we got actually a question around it already a little bit last week but i really would love to hear your opinion so the news of the week here is like that target started removing some of their lgbtq products after threats so uh, people were throwing the throwing those uh, things that were being on display uh, on the floor and everything there were, there were some violence volatile circumstances in, in in some of their shops so effectively they started to um, pull their merchandise out again and for instance they were in there like um, gender fluid mugs uh, children's books titled bye bye binary uh, pride one two three and I'm not a girl so uh, there's this good old saying go woke go broke but I'm just wondering, like, how do you look at Target? And, and why I'm asking, the share price is now around $130. It hasn't been trading there for a long time. $10 billion of market cap got wiped out after this news. So what, what do you think when you, when, you, when you hear this? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we touched on it last week that when they've released this kind of collection, they, they're trying to jump on a trend. We, we know that this LGBTQ is really really in the news the last maybe couple of years and companies are just trying to get on that and maybe trying to target new customers but in doing so i feel like they are alienating some other customers and it's 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 a hard balance for me but i i really think that they're really trying to throw this stuff in our face a little bit too much i i have no problem with the movement and i'd have no problem with target putting in a collection but come on children's books titled bye bye binary i can't like I just can't yeah. I can't deal with that. I mean, kids you're forcing stuff on kids who are not even mature enough to make their own decisions yet and you're you're forcing this kind of crap on them. Just 
there shouldn't be any kids books on this when you become an adult and, you, and you're aware of your body you're aware of who you want to be or what you want to be be binary be fluid be be whatever you want i've no issue but when it comes to kids i mean i'm not a fan of that but in terms of the the company itself would i look differently on them no it was a marketing campaign that went wrong and how many companies worldwide have had marketing campaigns that that go wrong probably yeah. all so, of them at some point uh, I, I also saw a bit of a podcast uh, from the ceo and i also analyzed target not too long ago i think i did a video about it and you know in its defense to target target has always been a front runner when it comes to um, diversity and inclusion so their whole history is about that it it is in their dna um so f when when i see that as well right i do believe that yeah it's it's then kind of normal that a company like target is practicing with this and and and, and because they really believe in it i believe i i see also for instance when it comes to gender diversity they have i think half of their store managers is is female which is really good i think but I think also personally they overreached here a little bit, little bit. But it is on the other hand a bit in in their DNA. So I, although I thought initially it was a marketing campaign maybe go wrong, but on on second thought, remembering what I analyzed about the company, this is target, yeah, uh, as such. So, um, but now if you start then putting your business head on, they they acted uh, swiftly. Yeah, by pulling it out specifically in the more let's say conservative states i guess uh to knock this off too many people so they responded to it so it's not just uh, uh pure ignorance only and for me these kinds of things i don't believe they will lose long term many customers with this um sp because often when you think about supermarkets it's about proximity walking distance or not okay, i guess in the states more about car <laughs> whether you can park your car well um so for me i actually see it more as a short-term buying opportunity and while my valuation is lower than 130 i did look at the yield and the growth history and the payout ratio so i bought uh, uh, 10 additional shares this week to just take uh, use of the opportunity and nibble a little bit in further because it is a great company in my opinion but uh, i hope they really see it as an experiment and not that they start pushing the boundary even further and that it doesn't motivate them even more yeah they are, are if they want to introduce this in terms of diversity they can but maybe keep it away from the kids section keep it keep it purely at us and I, I think maybe that's where where the biggest outrage is well what i'm seeing yeah. online is, is when you're targeting kids with, with these things i think let kids make up their own minds uh, put up a collection put up t-shirts put up banners put up whatever you want um, but stick it in the adult section only <laughs> yeah exactly okay then the next news and you know i, I need to give you uh, i need to give kudos here to coffeezilla do you know coffeezilla the youtuber no okay no. so coffeezilla is like uh, a guy who's just doing his own investigation about scammers and he has some really popular videos already like also how he dialed into this uh, what was it this uh, guy from uh, ftx from uh, this 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 coin exchanging uh, exchange platform yeah and he just released a video uh, about uncovering a 500 million scam and what is really interesting here is that there were quite some wealthy people and celebrities and and, and they have there an example where a guy deposited one million dollar uh to a to a company called traders domain and they even when they were transferring money they had to put services in the description because it was not about trading and such because then they would get in legal troubles but you know what the biggest issue was that people were attracted by they had a claim that in three years they can make 437 thousand percent in gains via day trading so then you have got these people here that are you know these kind of get quick rich schemes right and they 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 earned quite some money you know maybe some popular youtubers as such that felt like oh you know i can make some quick buck here and you know the, the typical happened you know after a certain moment they were not able to pull their money out when it a bit when it went a bit south and such but i mean th this this was a great reminder like even people that are successful yeah and you would think they understand a little bit about money are being subject to scams which are advertising 437 thousand percent in gains 
Now, for me, this this is flabbergasting. This news, like, uh, how is this possible? And then, actually, I know also you mentioned often about you know uh, your past about you know uh, you know I said being subject to impulse and such when it comes to investing. But for me, this is really flabbergasting. Like, if I would have a million, even if I would have five million on my bank account, whatever, uh, I wouldn't do that. And I, I, I know myself, I wouldn't do that. You you have to question the the sanity of these celebrities and, and wealthy blokes. I I know you you can get caught up in scams, but someone offering four thousand percent gain it doesn't even sound realistic. And you're putting in a lot of money. I mean, if there's a million dollars deposit into this it's that's a lot of money that you're expecting back i i don't see how if you are sitting there logically thinking about it could you expect to get anywhere near that amount of money yeah yeah if it, you put a million in there they're probably expecting four billion out of it or more it's it's pure greed that is, is all they got caught for there no, nothing more just greed yeah. they, they wanted to make do want to become a billionaire quickly um and unfortunately anyone offering four thousand percent it's more than likely going to be a scam. Yeah. So I, I will put the link uh, uh, to the video in the description. It will be a three-part series. He released the first one. But, oh boy. I mean, it's really worth worth watching. He, had, he has uncovered really some scammers, some really good ones. Does he give names? No, probably not. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, oh, he yeah, 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 yeah. He is at risk uh, at the moment, right? He's getting threatened and everything. So, Any celebrities we know? um no he's not i mean in the first episode not yet i mean he had a few people that were on camera explaining what happened to them um but of course he's investing investigating the company behind it the guy behind it but he exposes everyone yeah he, he's he's no bullshit guy <laughs> you're kind of guy like it yeah okay um we have only a couple of dividend hikes this week uh, we have american tower they hiked the dividend by a measly 0.6 percent to one dollar and 57 quarterly um this is kind of one where the dividend growth is starting to slow down over time it was really popular for a while this american tower and we're starting to see dividend growth slow down so i'm, I'm interested to hear your take on it I, were you looking at this company before yeah, I've been at least doing a bit of a screening and it was always too too richly valued for me on a price to FFO. But currently, they, at least from a price point of view, they've come down. I think they're a multi-year low, uh, around a multi-year low. So maybe I will look at it again. The question is why it's slowing down. Because if this is kind of structural slowing down, then you should also use lower multiples again than before. Yeah. So the, that's the question. Is the catalyst gone or not? And that's something I will look into. Good. And then the last dividend hike I have is Lowe's company, ticker symbol L-O-W. They hiked their dividend by 5%, which is not too bad. I, I think so. And it's always the question between Home, the Home Depot and Lowe's. And then in Europe, we have Hornbach as an example, Gastorama as well. Um, I think these companies will continue to do, to do well. Um, there's a lot of still home improvement going on everywhere. So yeah, uh, a nice one, and congrats to all the Lowe's, uh, I said, uh, shareholders. Yeah. So today we are going to talk about 3M. Why did we choose today to talk about 3M? I suppose they've been in the news quite a bit lately, both positively and negatively. Yeah, let's say that, um, first of all, I think um, it's a dividend darling, or a former dividend darling, with 65 years of dividend growth. But you know, the stock price dropped in over the last year from almost two hundred dollars to hundred dollars now. Yeah, and it was I think ninety two or ninety four dollars earlier this week. Then Friday, it got a really a steep bump to to hundred two. And the reason for that is also some news around the settlements. And there's also a reason why we are talking about it, right? Because the litigation in issues that they have, they're really severe. And we never really spoke deeply about what it means to the company um, and what it really is about. So I would really love to have the show a little bit of a fact-based discussion about it because most what we see in social media and such are simply the headlines. But for me, it's always uh, really important to remember why do you own a stock and do you know actually what you own? So I hope we can address this topic a little bit today and then also answer like, what will we do with our shares? At least what will I do also with my shares? Yeah. 
Yeah, it makes sense. And for, for those that I'm, I'm pretty sure that most people will know about 3M, but just as a quick intro, you did mention they are a dividend darling. In fact, they have 65 years of dividend growth, which is why you can see they're quite popular in the dividend growth community. I'd imagine if we were talking about this company in 2018, 2019, our thoughts would be a lot different than what they are today, um, yeah. which is which is quite something. Um, they operate in four main segments, so safety and industrial, transportation and electronics, healthcare and consumer, and I've named them in order of revenue as well. So safety and industrial is around 12 billion worth of their, their sales, and consumer is the lowest at around five five billion. Um, but I'm pretty sure most people will at least have heard of 3M or have used some of their products. So I don't think we need to to go deep into into what they do. But there is two main elephants in the room, isn't there? It's it's these litigations, and and there's two of them. There's two of them in lockstep. I think a lot of people might be forgetting that there is two different litigation battles going on. Yeah, and, and talking about forgetting. Um the everything money guys on youtube they did just a video about 3m and where the where this guy uh, this poll is saying like oh i just initiated position and bought some he did a whole uh, valuation and didn't mention any of the litigation issues at all <laughs> at all so sometimes i wonder if they are really doing their homework because they are always saying like we are here to teach you uh, how to fish and, and he even mentioned it right and then they do a video and don't a 10 minute video and not mention it once so again it you know i'm i'm also on youtube i also write a blog but guys please do more homework than just looking at the numbers if you, if anyone would have googled 3m on the first page you would have already seen something about the litigation i mean please embed this in your research don't go blindly on on us or on what you see on YouTube because people might forget about it or or in this case people might even not have researched it and and then you really don't know what you own but okay let's let's um uh, and, and yeah and this this is the group that calls out others uh, for being clowns right uh, yeah. that's the the fun yeah. part about it it's, yeah and they're also trying to push their own product constantly so that's why they yeah. focus on the numbers yeah exactly having said that um there are two main litigation uh, issues here. One is uh, PFAS, and the other one is around the uh, earplugs uh, that, that is being used in the military. And, and maybe why why PFAS is actually uh, so bad, right? So uh, generally speaking, right, researchers have found that PFAS, um, which is actually an industrial product used since the 1950s, uh, for instance, computer chips and, and, and non-stick frying, pans, cosmetics, that never breaks down naturally. And, and the issue is, uh, it gets into the landfills and therefore also into the waterways. And, and you know, um, it's, it's even just not possible to, to properly clean it uh, that easily. So um, effectively, our water is, is being intoxicated. Now, the US Environmental Protection Agency, um, they say that PFAS is linked to development delays in children and increased cancer risks and some researchers have linked them also to specific cancers of course 3m disputes this um and uh, i said and they 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 continue to mention that pfas doesn't pose any significant threat to public health and welfare but yeah that's nice but we know by now with Monsanto and Bayer and Johnson Johnson that that's not how the American court system works. So it comes down a lot to settlements. So, you know, you can imagine this is a big issue and it's not just an issue um, in America. It's also an issue close to home in, in Belgium and in, in, the, in the Netherlands there and the water and the river there. So, I mean, they're really, really, really in trouble. Now, so what happened then, right, in the news this week, there was, there was some news around uh, 3M striking a tentative settlement of at least, it's really important to say at least, uh, 10 billion over the water pollution claims tied to those chemicals, what they actually call forever chemicals, um, to, to insiders with this deal. And that's where the share price really jumped on. And, you know, this is really interesting for me that the share price jumped so much on this 
uh, I think it jumped even as much as 11% because this is 10 billion, yeah? But, you know, I read an article um, uh, somewhere because, because, yeah, no, before I go there, what's important, this uh, settlement is only for, you know, a, a small area uh, somewhere yeah. in South Carolina. Yeah, that's what I was going yeah. to get to, yeah. And there's the consolidation of 4,000 PFAS linked lawsuits. You know, the total guesstimate of the entire settlement globally is as great as 143 billion at a current market cap, let's say, of around 50, 55 billion. That's what we're really talking here. So I don't get this. I really, really don't get this hooray uh, uh, and cheering. Uh, in, in the stock market I, I i was surprised when i seen the stock price go up so much and i had to go on twitter straight away and i see settlement 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 as you said what what struck me first was that this is a tentative settlement of at least 10 billion so it's it's not a concrete it's not set in stone and they're going to pay at least 10 billion and then for it to be for 4,000 lawsuits in a small part of America, you're talking about South Carolina, which relative to the wider American population is, is quite small. So I didn't understand this whole jubilance about the stock price going up yeah. and everything seemed to be okay. I mean, this PFAS, I'm not even going to try and pronounce the, the long name for that, but mm -hmm. basically it's a synthetic chemical it's known as a forever chemical as you said because it's it's never going to weigh and if it affects people in south carolina it's going to affect people all over america and if they win this in south carolina what's to say they won't win that say in texas or idaho or anywhere else that 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 they have this going on and that's before they even get to europe which is different when it comes to lawsuits as well um it's that big figure of 143 billion which is quite scary now think about it the free cash flow the free cash flow last year was around three or four billion. Yes, and their uh, long-term debt is thirteen billion, one three. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, where's your <laughs> where's your dividend cover there? I mean, how, they can't. You're talking about bankruptcy here. That's 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 what you're talking about. You're talking about a company going out of business. That that's a hell of a lot of money. Um, I don't think it will look. That's worst case scenario. I don't think it's it's going to be one hundred forty-three billion. But even if you take a fraction of that, forty, fifty, sixty, seventy billion. It can do a lot of damage to, to this com company, particularly for dividend growth investors who I believe are probably the main types of investors in this type of company. Because yeah. it's slow yeah. growing, there's not a lot of growth, there's not a lot of transition or change, there's not a lot of catalysts, it's just steady growing and it pays a steady dividend. That's that's the whole lure to this company. And without that, yeah. what do they have? Yeah, and, and I, I, I don't understand also a little bit at the moment the credit rating agencies, of course, they mention, mention about it. But why with this litigation overhang, it is not considered junk, yeah, or at least close to junk? Why does it still have an uh, A rating? That, that's what I don't understand because it, it is as much also a future look um, yeah. into the company. Well, to give them some credit and sometimes we don't like to give them credit all the, all the time because we know that their interests are linked if they did that the stock price would collapse let's let's be honest and at the moment we're talking ifs and buts around numbers we don't know the hard fact numbers at the moment this is at least 10 billion potentially up to 143 but we don't know that so for a credit rate to go out and say this is now junk it would have a huge effect on on the company so yeah. i think i think they're, i think they're in a bit of a rock and a hard place they probably would like to downgrade them but if they do it, it would have a disastrous effect so but it also shows you that you can't just rely on credit ratings it's, it's good to read them but in times like this you really 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 have to know what you want and do your own research yes and if this sounds already depressing we, we haven't even spoken about the earplug earplug litigation so here again right um it's about at least knowing a little bit what it is about and the interesting around interesting fact about earplug litigation for me was and i i had to do some additional research again for myself is that this was you know these these 3m earplugs and maybe it's the irony it was actually a result of a collaboration between the u.s military and and, and their representatives and arrow 
uh, the company um, uh, that they acquired. Yeah, so th this earplug was kind of co-created with the military in the late 90s. And uh, with that, they created a second version of what they call the combat combat arms earplug. And this one was designed to really eliminate the need for soldiers to carry two different sets of earplugs. Yeah, so it was like two in one. Um, uh, so they could then warn it in one way uh, to block the sound like traditional earplugs. And if they would warn it the other way, it would block only certain types of loud battlefield noise while still allowing um, uh, to hear other kinds of sounds. So I guess to be more responsive in the battlefield. Luckily, I've never been in a battlefield, but that's what I take away from it. So the issue now really with those earplugs is, is that they can be too short in a particular wearer's ear canal and can fail therefore to form a proper seal to effectively pr protect the inner ear from the damaging noise. Yeah, so that sounds to be quite a uh, design flaw uh, that we are talking here about. And now I also understand like why why they are having these issues with with earplugs although you might argue like why 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 were people wearing them anyway and because here i would also like to think a little bit like guys there's also something on the military side probably where they could have been doing a bit better job specifically if this pops up after 20 years but talking about uh, buying a cat in a bag again right so for me 3m bought this company and boom, get all the litigation shit in their ear, in their eyes. So in this case, uh, also uh, just news like two weeks ago that a federal judge has ordered the CEO to attend a mediation meeting aimed at resolving nearly 260,000 lawsuits. Yeah. Uh, you know, what, what is probably good to know, 3M has lost already 10 of the 16 cases that were brought to court. And this, this costed them about 265 million uh, um, of, of, of fines, let's say. And f yeah, you want to say it, go ahead. Uh, I mean, look, as you said, 265 million for 16 cases on top of the 450 million in defense costs. This is 16 cases. They've got 260,000 lawsuits here. That's yeah. a that's a lot of a lot of I, I can't even I can't even calculate that off the top of my head. That's that's billions. That's billions and billions. I mean, this is potentially going like we we got two two serious lawsuits here, and either one on their own could potentially put this company out of business. It's yeah. quite it's quite scary when 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 you look at that, and and it's worrying for me when I see all this on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, three M under a hundred. It's like it's like. AT&T under 30 that time. It's that same type yeah. of feel. Uh, I think people are getting lost in the history of the company. Yes, they have a 6% yield. Yes, they have a good history. But also, come on, look at their potential costs here. They're, they're potentially going to go bankrupt here. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is where I think we also need to um i said really give credit to people that really look into the name wasn't it russ also who did a movie about 3m that really said like guys watch out watch out with this one yeah and yeah for me this is insane but just already the defense cost so when i read defense costs i think about lawyers <laughs> yeah. yeah 450 yeah. million that's that's you know <laughs> Even if these lawsuits of both PFAS and uh, uh, I said um, the other one, the earplugs turn out well, they will still like add like a few billion probably in debt just because of lawyers. I mean, if if you want to invest in someone in this scenario, find out who's representing 3M. Invest in that business. Yeah. And if they that. are trading, if they are on the <laughs> stock exchange, <laughs> even if they're private, try get your money into that company somehow because. They are the only winners here, really. They're the only winners. Uh, but of course, look, 3M, they got smart guys in the boardroom. They're, they're not stupid. They know this is happening. They know this is potentially blockbusting. It can, it can wipe them out. So they're not sitting around idle on their hands. They are trying to prepare a little bit about this. And on their last quarterly results, they did announce some restructuring actions. Um, and if I take the line from directly from their report that says 3M is taking restructuring actions that are intended to make 3M stronger, leaner, and more focused. I really wish they said laser focused there, but 
essentially they're trying to free up as much money as possible to to fund these litigations um some of that is by making roughly around 8500 positions redundant that's, that's a lot a lot of people that are letting go and that's going to save them they say pre-tax of up to seven to nine hundred million probably looking at after tax 500 million in savings there half a billion additional cash flow yeah i mean it feels for me like uh, they are trying to uh, find this uh, penny jar yeah when you get home you throw your 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 pennies in there and then after a few years you can buy something from it i feel that they're reaching this stage soon because they need to find money money everywhere and yeah i think reducing yeah closing down stuff i think that's one way of doing it the other way is like innovate yourself the hell out of this yeah uh, by by a new business but for me I, I you know the issue is now like this company is is really how you say it it's in a sandwich yeah and uh, what 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 can it really do now it just needs to have successes in these lawsuits that's yeah. what it needs and I'm, I'm, that's that's exactly what it needs and then i look at the company i think okay have they got any tailwinds as you said they need to do something and innovate and innovate the head out of it come up with new products buy new businesses maybe but i look i don't see any tailwinds what do i see i see okay they're exiting the russian market after the invasion of ukraine that's hampered them a little bit we can see the revenue has has dropped not significantly but a nice portion the respirator demand went down after after COVID. pricing limitations uh, all this all this stuff before the pandemic that we've seen we can see inflation hitting them really hard for some of the products that are really price sensitive and i think a lot of people are paying too much hope on china reopening and the demand increasing but i just i see too many headwinds and not enough growth or, yeah. or tailwinds for me and I just don't see the catalyst. I, I don't see the story of buying 3M right now. Yeah. Well, you know, um, we are we sound really bearish and depressed about this stock, but shall we at least close it with a valuation? What our stock dashboard says. Yeah. Let's let's give the numbers. Okay. So, is the dividend safe? Our our dashboard says, so based on the metrics, it's questionable with a score of 41, and 41 is just above unsafe because we have the boundary of 20 to 40 as unsafe so just above it the reason for that is is that they have a five-year average free cash flow growth in the minus they have a slow five-year average eps growth the debt equity is 85 towards the 100 um, and the payout ratios for free cash flow stand at 83 percent and the eps payout ratio of 70 percent and you usually get points if it's like below 60. At the same time, we believe that the growth prospects of the company are weak. So yeah, this is what the reason why um, the dividend is uh, questionable. Now, maybe some some statistics. If you look, for instance, at the earnings per share back in 2015 and the free cash flow per share at the time, then the free cash flow per share is now lower than what, what it was, let's say, in 2014, 2015. So we are like eight, nine years down the road. And we are not making the same we are not generating the same cash earnings per share looks good generally more on the high end now over the years they have been reducing the share count from about 700 million shares to about 560 million shares now a decade later but you know that comes also at the cost of debt yeah because their long-term debt went from um i said from about no, 12 billion in 2017 to in 2020 to 18 billion but they've been paying it off afterwards because of the COVID uh, uh, cash flow that uh, came in and and you know not repurchasing so many shares at that time so they are back at 13 billion now and they have been particularly I think buying back uh, or I would say paying down debt since they know about these litigation issues however if you if you look at debt to equity it's standing now at an 86 percent yeah and if they indeed will settle for 10 billion and they need to fund it via debt yeah and not share issue because dilution is really at at risk here 
um, yeah, then the debt to equity number will shoot through the roof straight away. Uh, just this small settlement already for a really sub portion of their entire lawsuit. Now, if we look at the entire key statistics, right? Five year dividend growth of 5%, but um, the last two years it has been growing with, I, I, what is it, less than 1% probably. Yeah. So we shouldn't take too much uh, uh, joy out of that number. And if we look at the return on capital, it's currently around 7%, slightly above the wage weighted average cost of capital. So the numbers just have really deteriorated over the last three, four years, although they had a bit of a free cash flow boost from COVID. Now, if you take this all into consideration, right, and you use 4 billion in, in free cash flow, that's where it is about right now as a baseline, assuming that they are able to maintain their sales net from uh, the litigation issues. If you then consider, let's say, a growth rate for the next five years of 4% and then 2% thereafter, which I think represents a little bit our feeling about how the business is doing, yeah. at the discount rate of 12.5%, because we are now in another interest rate environment, and maybe for the risk, you should actually put a discount rate here of 20%, but okay, let's stick with 12.5% and then a terminal multiple of 14 you know, based on, 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 let's say, what you would like to pay for this business would then be $88. Yeah, so $88 means that it's still overvalued, still overvalued based on our, our yeah. forecast, how we look at the business. If we start to include here also 140 billion in litigation, the intrinsic value of the company would turn into 88 billion billion in the minus and we're effectively talking about bankruptcy here yeah yeah if it would be even half yeah then then still we are talking about a negative intrinsic value so you know this doesn't look bright just the numbers just don't add up the company is still overvalued uh, based on our growth forecasts and yeah so tell me do you have a position in 3m no, no. Luckily, luckily, I don't. I I got out after this, after the announcement of the latest litigation, and I'm kind of happy that I did. I mean, you you mentioned our dividend safety score was 41. I think we're being a little bit even optimistic there because we're giving it a little bit of credit in terms of its dividend history. We're saying that yeah. has a five percent five year dividend growth rate, which it has, but I don't think we're going to see that going forward. And it also has 65 years history which which gives it a, a bit yeah. of a score and couple that then with the a1 credit rating so i think those three are inherently not keeping correct. it up yeah 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 so i would actually put the dividend into unsafe territory and, and yeah. the risk of a dividend cut is really really severe in my opinion i mean look we've been really negative on this and i don't know if there's many out there that has been as negative as we have been but i just can't see a catalyst for this and the numbers as you said do not add up. So I don't have a position. I was kind of tuning from beforehand that if they got good news on the second on the earplugs, that maybe it might be a good time to to maybe buy into them. But I'm now I'm actually reconsidering that. Based on all everything that we've talked about today, I I don't even know if I have any interest in in looking at this company anymore. But I know you have shares. And yes, I yes. I have fifty shares in this company because I've been accumulating them over the years when it was going relatively well right on the dip so my average share base is around 150 dollars so yeah i'm one third in the minus so i have like two thousand dollars in the minus at the moment it's uh, having a yield of 5.8 percent or something like that so you know based on this i cannot do anything else than sell so what i will do is i will start probably shelling uh, selling like 10 shares here 10 shares there and straight away reallocate my funds into another stock i don't want to keep 3m um, i hope i will be able to sell it during the summer yeah m maybe now i will sell my first 10 stocks uh, this this week um because if i do all at once then uh, I don't know where I should put all the money in at once. So, uh, and I also don't think like in the next two, three months, suddenly the share price will be at $20 or bankruptcy. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's not how quickly this develops. So I will take my time during the sun, uh, during the summer to unwind my position. And from there I will practice not FOMO, 
but actually jomo the joy of missing out <laughs> because there are so many other stocks in the world i mean we're just talking about target yeah yeah of course different yield profile but you know also 50 years of dividend growth uh, has some headwinds now because of some news which i don't think is a fundamental impact to the business so there are just much better stocks out there and yeah i'm going to get rid of my 3m and i'm really happy that we did this show because until now i was a little bit like reading the headlines as well myself but also i'm so busy at work that i have hardly time to analyze stocks so taking 3m now and doing a bit of a deeper dive to really understand the problem has really helped me making this decision and i've listened i've learned to listen to our dashboard every time when it rung on safe the dividend got cut somehow in the in, in the next 12 months yeah and i can see three three options here the company will dilute the hell out of shell shareholders um they will take massive debt on or they will have to file bankruptcy maybe not as a company as a whole but parts of the business because probably it's a spider web of legal entities yeah so i don't see how they can uh, pay a growing dividend and if they do it it will be the houdini act of the century from a dividend stock uh, point of view yeah yeah but that risk that risk far away is any any positive for me so it, it is something i'm definitely not willing to bet on the, the only the only thing i would say from your perspective is they've had some good news once we don't have any more negative news over the summer we know the debt ceiling agreement has been reached so it looks yeah. like more money is going to be printing that usually finds its way into the stock market you could see that by default go up a little bit closer to your to your um average baseline which which mightn't hurt you as much yeah but could also go lower it could if yeah. if, <laughs> if, the, if if there's any bad news it's for sure it's, it's going yeah no i I've, I've learned to not think like that in the beginning as an investor i was always trying to make up my losses i've learned to not do that just cut it but for instance i can use this um uh, reinvest the funds maybe at stocks that are trading around the five to six percent yield as a yeah. high yielder um with a better dividend safety uh, here and that's how i at least protect my dividend income to some extent yeah and of course you've held these for a long time so your yeah. net loss won't be as large because of the dividend dividend income you would have earned from from them yeah yeah okay we have a ton of listeners questions so i hope everyone enjoyed our bearish view on 3m i would love to hear everyone else's opinion uh, do you agree with us do you not let us know facebook twitter anywhere um but we have a load of questions to get through now so we'll do our best to get through as many as possible um and we'll start with richard's one and richard asked the question are you close to the boring middle part how do you have any ideas to combat this and stay on track and he means the boring middle part like the middle of the year that's what he means or middle of the journey of dividend investing see I, I wasn't sure and I when I read it I thought it was the middle part of the journey that's that's what yeah. I that's what I assumed well I would advise Richard to start a podcast then yeah, yeah it really does something to it he he can start by coming on to our podcast I would love to have Richard on he's such a clever and fun guy um I would love to have Richard on on the show um I'm going to I as I said I'm going to stick with the theory of the boring middle part of the journey and how I stick with it is I know you released a tweet about your your May income I haven't checked but man this was my best month yet that's how I stay motivated my my record last year was June last year which was 629 euro May this year I'm on 645 euro and I expect June oh, to be yeah. even better so it's actually I I, I couldn't believe it I, I didn't I didn't open my broker once throughout May not once and I just calculated it all yesterday and I got some shock I was not expecting I was not expecting it to be so large yeah and and, and this magic is just doing wonders I mean what can you buy for it right you can you can probably pay the whole month of fuel as an example your electricity bill your yeah. your phone bill yeah I mean I mean in Ireland that's an average weekly wage so whatever you could buy for a week <laughs> after tax that that's what I could buy with that so it's it's um it's quite a big amount now obviously may and june we have a lot of european companies it's it's inflated in those yeah. months but it's it's definitely motivating to see that you can earn that type of income in a single month and that's that's what keeps me on track yeah and 
try uh, imagine how you were trying to save this amount of money just 10 years ago yeah, yeah. of course yeah 10, 10 years ago even when 18 19 that might have took me maybe a whole year to save that amount of money so yeah that's the power of dividend investing and for me it never gets boring but i understand what he means like in the beginning you fall in love yeah you have really this like in your belly these butterflies and everything when you discover dividend investing yeah. you can't stop reading and everything and this is like a marathon yeah so you're now at this stage maybe at the 20 kilometer line where you start wondering like shit i still need to go half away uh, my legs start to hurt a little bit so you know, and that's why I think Richard, the community, is plays an essential part of it on Facebook and on Twitter because here we help each other out and keep each other motivated and do the refills with water, do the do the uh, cheering when you're passing by, right? That that's what the community is about. Yeah, and and in our in our dividend group, uh, the saying that goes anytime anyone talks about something ridiculous, like if I'm talking about trading penny stocks, for example, you'll get straight away stick to dividends, boys and girls, <laughs> straight away. So. It's um, yeah, the community is definitely definitely one way to stay motivated and on track. Um, Centrino, it's not a question from Centrino, but he has an awesome suggestion which I agree with. He says, European DJI, you should create a video course on how to analyze the three financial reports. He would buy it, and I'm pretty sure most of the community would buy it also. Well, that's really flattering to say so um but i don't consider myself uh, a guru in this or something like that there are way better people than me that can explain this uh, i did um, let's say a half year accounting course so yes i learned how to read it and everything but i'm not a specialist sometimes i see answers on social media about balance sheets that i need to go back to my uh, thousand page bible of accounting standards and i wouldn't have guessed this or found this and uh, centrino i don't want to be in a position um where i'm effectively causing issues uh with with people that are investing based on things that i maybe understand wrong so i'm a bit on the conservative side there i use really my videos to explain how i'm doing things how i'm looking at things but i really feel like everyone should be accountable for their own money making decisions and um, I said I do know that some people people copy uh, things that I'm doing and I already feel uncomfortable with it but if I would ask even people money for a training I feel like that's when the moment where you go from inspiring and being an amateur to becoming a professional and then you may also expect from me being in a CPA or something like that and I'm not so I don't expect I will ever do this um, as a course, never. I also am not on social media to earn money with this. I, I do like when people buy me a coffee because it covers my costs for licenses, for video editing, for keeping my blog online, because there are quite some costs involved. But other than that, no way, no. Thank you, Centrino, very flattering, but I don't think it will ever happen. I, I will say, if you do change your mind, I, I think it would be a great idea, but I will disown you if you put on Twitter quick only five copies remaining <laughs> <laughs> then please unfollow me yeah. um tiago asked us when we expect to get the dividend talk yacht um when we become the new warren and charlie when they're talking about edgi and derek as the new warren buffett and charlie munger that's when i'll buy a yacht Nah, but it wouldn't be a yacht. It would be such a small boat where we need to paddle ourselves because we know where where we want to earn. We would buy, buy a yacht company rather. Exactly. Hey, that's not a bad idea. Um, Dazzy Mikey, luxury stocks like LVMH, Hermes, Prada, Herring, or luxury brands are taking a bit of a beating lately on the news that demand for entry level designer goods is dropping in the US of A. What's your view on luxury stocks and caring in particular? So for me, we, we talk about these, we talk about Louis Vuitton all the time, Hermes we've talked about, we've even talked about caring. And I always struggle with these types of stocks because they've always been one overvalued, but two, they've always outperformed the market and seem to do well in challenging times and times I would not expect them to do well. And I was thinking about this last night when I read the question and some of the reason I believe that they do so well is I don't think their target audience is the middle class like us. I don't think it's I don't think it's aimed at people that will struggle in recessions. It's aimed at people with lots of money that want to have 
all the nice clothes that can afford to have the nice clothes and generally speaking recessions don't really affect them a whole lot so i can understand why they do quite well but i would struggle personally to buy these companies because i feel in my mind that they should be struggling during a recession but in terms of caring i think it's a it's a look i think it's a fantastic company it has really strong brands and if you look at the annualized dividend growth rate their 10-year annualized dividend growth rate is 14 percent the one-year annualized growth rate is 16 percent and now you're getting a 2.8 percent dividend yield starting as well so it looks quite attractive from that point of view they have cut the dividend in the past as well they have strong revenue strong cash flows but for me it's just it's just valuation for me with these companies it's always quite hard yeah. you're, you're always looking at a 30 pe ratio with for these. yeah of course i wish I, I i would have some of those but i don't know i i got a bit of a thick skin of 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 uh, not being too afraid of missing out we get this question a lot but i mean i think it's in the netherlands where we are expression like better one bird in the hand than 10 up in the air you know I have Microsoft. It gave me this kind of a multiple expansion plus plus growth story. So you know, I've I've got my part of it in my portfolio. It's good enough. And once they come down, trade at uh, proper valuations, and there's still enough catalysts, I will be a buyer, but not at all cost. Exactly. But I can understand the fascination around the brands, the brand power that they have. We speak about brand power quite a lot, and these companies certainly certainly have them. So um in terms of your question around caring i think the yield is decent the trading at around 17 trading pe ratio so it looks like it's actually not too bad compared to say louis vuitton um but but like that i do expect demand personally i would expect demand to weaken over the next year um certainly with with the price and inflation going the way it's going so not for me not for me um, Martin has asked us, have you ever heard or ever checked out Lotus Bakeries, ticker symbol L-O-T-B? Um, what I have to say is I, I didn't hear about them before, but I believe I looked at a lot of companies yesterday, but I, I believe they were a Belgium company. They make cookies and all sorts of bakeries. But the first thing that struck my mind was look at that share price, 6 thousand euro nearly for for this company i couldn't believe it and their dividend their dividend is 45 euro per share um obviously that gives it a, a low dividend yield which would not meet our criteria but honestly it looked like they, they like looked like they did quite well for a bakery company i i don't understand how they're making so so much money to be honest with you um my only concern is that the free cash flow is a little bit choppy um it is now negative last year the trailing 12 months is also negative it's been declining um which for me poses a risk to the dividend but the dividend has been growing it looks quite strong um in terms of the growth but the free cash flow would worry me particularly a bakery as such now i don't understand the whole business it's a brief overview but that type of company and that four pe ratio is a whopping 39 euro so far too expensive and i would be worried about free cash flow but yeah it was impressive to see that <laughs> six thousand euro a 45 euro dividend so nice nice so then dividend yogi is asking our opinion on the weak performance of pharma stocks at the moment and do we consider to add some more he, he asks about uh, johnson johnson up vm rush for instance so yeah i've been buying johnson johnson just to add a little bit uh, to my position i do this usually on the dip and that's what i've done here and Upfi, I've got already a full position, so not so interesting interesting for me at the moment. How about you? Have you been buying any pharma stocks? I, I haven't been, but I'm looking at adding to Johnson & Johnson, particularly in the dip. Um, Abby, not particularly in, in Rush. I really like Rush as a company, but it's the Swiss dividend tax that I hate. So you have uh, to look at them after yeah. tax. Um, but yeah, I think pharma stocks, as you said, they are weakening at the moment, but that presents good opportunities to buy buy farmer stocks so it's definitely definitely sector to keep to keep an eye on um alex has asked us do you have any internal principles on how frequently or for what amount you should purchase european stocks to maintain a european flavor dividend growth 
investing. I, so I don't have any principles, but I do man measure, let's say, on a half a year basis, how my portfolio composition looks like from a currency point of view. And then I make adjustments. So uh, generally speaking, naturally about the opportunities that come my way by also studying European stocks, I actually do quite well. Uh, so I usually don't need to adjust. Yeah, me too. I, I don't really have any principles. I am around 50-50 um, by default. The only thing I would say is that if I was coming into buying, particularly around May and June, you look at usually European companies, the ex-dividend date is a few days before they pay. I'm more likely to maybe take advantage of European companies at that stage. But as as a whole, I don't I don't have any set criteria, but I am I am roughly 50-50 at the moment. Yeah, I've, I've got 55% in US dollars and the other 45% in Euro, British pounds, Swedish crowns, these kinds of things. Nice. Um, DG investing. How do we buy US treasury bills? As European investors, we can't buy on treasury direct and he doesn't see value to buy on the secondary market. Uh, I don't buy. I'm not interested in them. Yeah, I, I haven't a clue, to be honest. Um, I would agree with you. I wouldn't be buying something like that on a secondary market, but I have no clue as a European how I would even go about buying them. So, yeah. sorry. Um, Davide has asked us, what are your thoughts about Unilever right now? Um, not a lot, not a lot. I want to see more of, um, I want to see more stronger performance about from the company. Um, it's of course an iconic company struggling for years, uh, Ellen Yopi out. Um, I want to see them a little bit more returning to growth. Now, if I look at the ice cream prices and I look at the Magnums, I do expect some, uh, proper margin growth over the summer because I can really see that they ha they are probably taking a benefit out of inflation. So there's where I have some expectations that they will show a bit of growth because of what they've been doing with the packaging and the pricing. I feel that they are increasing the prices way above inflation. Also, AXA deodorant that I used uh, uh, for some time seems to be like 40-50% up compared to last year, at least here in Poland. So. These are all Unilever products, and yeah, I have now high expectations about the profit itself, but generally uh, saying I think Unilever needs to find out its way, uh, its path back to growth. And it has been going through this phase several times in history. That's why the dividend growth is uh, not there. They're really conservative about it, but I think 20, 30 years from now, they, they will do well. Uh, the question is then it's now a time to buy. I think there are better moments. Yeah, I agree. I, I've kind of put Unilever to the back of my mind. Um, they, yeah, they, are, they, are. they have a position. I mean, look, they have a new CEO. You have to give him a chance as well to see what the exactly. company, company is doing. They're kind of yo-yoing between 42 and 47 in terms of price range. Um, so, yeah, I'm not expecting a whole lot of growth. And I'm just, just leaving them sit there. Just a corner that I'm happy to forget about at, at the moment. Um, Toko Bono has asked us, what are our thoughts on Palfinger and Infineon? Um, so Palfinger AG, they're an Austrian company, and it's it's quite strange that we hear a company from Austria, but they are involved in the selling of cranes and all that kind of equipment, um, which I think is, is quite an interesting business model. Um, you know, like the telescopic booms, the scissor lifts and all those. Um, so I found that that quite interesting in terms of a business model. They have a 10-year total return of around 2.86%, which is not great. The dividend yield is 2.65, and their market cap is around 1 billion. Um, looking at the company, I actually thought they were they were okay. Um, I did have some some concerns, as I said, in the industry itself. It's it's quite quite a small small business the free cash flow is extremely extremely choppy and i suppose the first thing i look at when i'm looking at a company that i don't really know anything about is probably their free cash flow how much free cash flow are they able to bring in can they afford that dividend how much debt have they got um the long-term debt is around 450 million compared to total revenues of 2.3 billion um 
So the long term debt is around 66 percent, which is which is okay. It's middle of the road. Um, but I do have concerns about the dividend in terms of if the free cash flow is safe. But I think it's I think it's an interesting business model. Cranes, we use them all the time. The Senki company, Infineon was actually a little bit more interesting for me. Um, it actually reminded me of the days when I was back in college talking about MOSFET transistors and um, discrete and non-discrete chips. So they sell all, all these kinds of things. Um, I forgot about m most of, of that in my college days because I've gone on to a, a different role, but it's it was definitely interesting. It's a German company, first of all. We missed this when we covered our German companies. They have a better 10-year total return. It's 20%, but their dividend yield is only 0.89%. Um, but in terms of free cash flow, it is definitely a lot better. They generate roughly 1.5 billion in free cash flow. Their dividend is only 500 million, so you can see that's quite good. Um, less than 50, less than 30 percent payout ratio. Um, they've got very little debt. On, oh no, they do. They've got 5 billion in debt. Um, so their debt to equity is 32 percent, and their dividend growth was also quite good. So of the two companies, I would definitely look at Infineon. But the yield is definitely too low for me. Uh, but good, yeah. good, good dividend, good dividend growth rate. Ten years is 10.3 percent. 10 yeah, Infineon, I think, reminds me also about composing my own uh, uh, desktop PC, where you could buy the RAM uh, from Infineon. Yes, no. yes, yes, and and that, I'm sure that that's what they that's what they have as well. They, they sell all that, but they do all um, I don't know diodes, transceivers. Um, mm -hmm. Let me let me see if I can remember my days. IGBT um, modules and transistors and amplifiers, all this fun stuff, which is quite important in today's electronics. I have to say, um, I'm yeah. sure they have some LED technology and lighting. If I remember from yeah. my days as electrician as well, so um, definitely, definitely nice, nice of, the, of the two, the most interesting company. Okay, then Emmach, yes, uh, two questions. And the first one is like, what do you think about Alexandria real estate? So, not a whole lot. I've, I've heard about these a few times. Dividend Seeker talks about them quite a bit on Seeking Alpha, also on Twitter. Um, I don't really have too much of an opinion about them, but I think it might be good to have someone like Dividend Seeker on the show. I know he's quite popular on Seeking Alpha talking about REITs to get his opinion. On these types of companies i don't know do you do you have alexandra no, do you know no, no no um i'd like to have okay. someone with a bit more knowledge on real estate investment trust to talk about these types of companies yeah exactly exactly maybe uh we can get brett thomas also one time having said that um you know he also asked like what he wants to add some consumer staples to his portfolio and he's considering Target, Kroger, the Giaggio or Coca-Cola. And which one do you like the most at this point in time? For me, it's Target at the moment. But also uh, Ahal Del Herze is, uh, is coming a little bit uh, again down, which is also a company that I maybe want to round up my number of positions into the 100. Num I mean, I've got more than 100, but like, like a nice round number and not anymore like uh 68 in the end let's say yeah yeah um for me diageo and coca-cola would be the two but target as you discussed earlier could be a buy as well um i really like what coca-cola did in terms of restructuring and i don't think we've seen quite the benefit of that check we have some tricky mm -hmm. times since they completed that but i think they've put themselves in a really good position and look it's a it's warren yeah. buffett favorite as well so coca-cola exactly Hey, then uh, Tim Ainley from Facebook is asking Kona or Otis? And I think we're talking here about the business of escalators and elevators, I guess. Um, yes, yeah, both of them, both of them the same. One is an American company, one is Finnish, I believe. Um, as a Europeans, we have to stick with Kona. Of course. <laughs> they've, they've been around a lot longer and they've also paid bonus dividends in the past. Um, they have a longer dividend history. Um, both quite similar, quite similar business models. But hey, if you're unsure, why not buy both? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Then uh, Alex, uh, our moderator, also in the Facebook group, uh, is asking like, what do you think the future holds for office rates? And this is a really interesting question because it's actually a question about the new normal. Yeah, and do we still need so much office space? 
compared to what we needed before. So, look, I think it comes down to which office rates. There will be some office rates that are probably high on debt, ha being in poor locations because they couldn't compete because of, for instance, the lack of quality management, the lack of the, the lack of network, the la lack of proper business deals. So I would really go to those office rates that are, I mean, for instance, Wall Street. Yeah, I think there's still a good reason to have your office on Wall Street there. Yeah, that's something different than when you're in the outskirts of Watford, as an example. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. with you, with your your office space. So I think it just requires more homework and more due diligence. But honestly, it would have required that already before COVID as well. But maybe at that moment if, in time, if you just throw threw a dart on the board, you would have done well. Yeah. And that's, I think, it, there are fundamental changes. Companies don't need so much office space anymore as before. So I do see overall office capacity shrinking uh, in the world, specific, specifically for the knowledge working industry. Um, yeah, you need to make sure that you have companies that can weather that and don't have too much exposure to it. Yeah, location, location, location. I think that's that's key. And finding quality real estate investment trusts that could potentially rebound. Um, the only caveat I have is I don't know which ones are, are quality or not in, in terms of the space. But um, yeah, this this made me think um, a lot last night. I honestly don't think the office culture is dead. Personally, um, I know I know it will reduce, but people working from home on their own, it can be quite lonely and isolated. And I think long term, this might have some impact on people's personalities and mental stability and stuff. So I think having an office space is good to interact with people, other humans, adults. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a, a very good question. Um, but well, if if you say like mental health is an issue for people working from home, you can also um, do it like this: you buy an office REIT and you you buy a pharma stock that is uh, strong in antidepressiva <laughs> and such. Yeah, and you have the uptake on the other side. Yeah, I, I, I'm just talking about my own experience working at home. I I struggled with it. I I didn't like it. Um, I only did it for a short period. I think it was two or three months. Um, and luckily, I was needed. I'm 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 more of a hands-on engineer, so it's hard to fix a machine from my from my yeah. room here um but i couldn't imagine doing that forever because I, I knew no, but in the it industry it has fundamentally changed derek i work mm -hmm. there uh, we need maybe 25 percent of capacity to the past people started moving out of the cities working on distance and the office space is still needed for people to meet uh, but it's, it's, it will be a bit more meaningful and I, I i don't see that coming back in the next decade there's no need for it either we are used to i mean there makes no sense for many office workers to just sit all the day in a cubicle talking to people globally makes utterly no sense and that will not come back not anytime soon yeah cool um, Adam Bacon has asked us, do you take notice of upcoming ex-dividend dates when deciding between a few stocks to invest in? No, not at all. Um, no, just not at all. Not at I, all. I touched on it above uh, May and June. Yes, I will look more at my European companies. Um, I think it's a good, if you're buying them for the dividend, it's, it's probably a good time to buy them just before ex-dividend date because they pay typically once a year. Um, mm -hmm. So if, if you buy them before, you get the dividend if you buy them afterwards you'll have to wait nearly a whole year again so that, that that's the only time but in if if it's a european company like unilever that pay quarterly for example it doesn't bother me because there's always opportunities and you're, you're not yeah. missing out right yeah. um so that's that's the only time i would i would look at it um paolo piera has asked us our thoughts on three different stocks um anglo american which has a ticker symbol of a a L, not American Airlines, it's mm -hmm. a different one. Um, Carl Zeiss Medtech, which has a ticker symbol of AFX. And then the last one is BASF, which is ticker symbol BAS. So, you know, BASF, I think, um, I mean, I'm a long-term shareholder in this one. And I know they have issues and they were a lot in the news around, let's say, uh, uh, how you say it, the gas imports from Russia and such, and all the sanctions. But this company is well managed, you know, good balance sheet, safe dividend. And I think the scare in the media is a little bit over. The stock is still priced low 
uh, from compared to where it has been uh, historically trading, but also shows the cyclicality of the business. But I think, and again, th this is how I usually think, right? I think 10, 20 years from now, BAS F will be doing better than, than what it's doing today, unless it gets some litigation because it might have some old industry. God knows what they have been all producing in the past. Um, but generally, I, I'm, I'm, I'm good with Bus F and the other two companies. I simply don't know. I, I, I understand indeed that AL is a mining company, uh, but not a stable dividend. So I would definitely already shy away from it. And and Carl Zeiss is a medical device company for eye disease. That at least uh, appeals me because I see catalysts there with an aging population, eye diseases. So I just don't know it. But a low yield and a high PE makes me already not interested to to dive into it yeah yeah S similar kind of thoughts I, I really think kudos have to go to bass f management i think they've navigated this past 12 months extremely well um, and i don't see an issue with their dividends are getting quite a high yield there i think it's around eight percent um so i have to say i'm really happy with my position in, in bass f AFX, as you said, medical device company in the eye disease. I mean, like that, it would interest me. Um, but I read their products, I read their pipeline, I read what they're involved in. And honestly, I have no clue if they're good or not. It, it's just a lot of big fancy names to me, and they could be good, they might not be good. Um, but I had a look at their yield, which is 1%, and their PE ratio, which was 36. Um, and I decided not to, to look any further. And AAL, um, as I said, mining company. I'm already in and out of Rio Tinto. I don't need. I don't need another one. Again, you're getting quite a high dividend yield here, but it's it's variable as that as you would expect in that industry. Um, but yeah. I I think for me, sticking with Rio Tinto is probably makes more sense. Yeah. Then Marek has a really interesting uh, question, and he's saying that recently Sven Carlin has told that his investment strategy is not to beat the market. And it's not a game he wants to play. And what do we think about the statement? And, you know, it's it's actually a really simple question, Marek. I dream of being financially independent because it will give me opportunities that I don't have today. Effectively, it means like I can then decide if I want to continue working or not, whether I want to do charity or not, whether I want to do travel or not. I haven't made up my mind there yet, but that's my dream. And my only focus is in realizing that dream. And for that to realize that goal, to reach that dream, I've put a financial plan in place. I know what I need to invest. I know at what yield and what the, the dividend growth should be. I'm kind of halfway on track uh, for this. And that's my only measure of performance. I was just talking about 3M and selling it at a loss. You know, I think if you start thinking about beating the market, you get all kinds of incentives to not do that and maybe to wait uh, because you might then fall into the value trap thinking around uh, 3m um so I'm, I'm also not playing that game um but if you look at it generally i think the s p 500 was it last year when it dropped 20 percent or the year before and, and my, my my portfolio was almost flat so you win some you lose some but i i usually don't even properly track it uh, I, I always I always chuckle when people talk about beating the market um, or if, if you underperform the market, it's almost like a yardstick of who's better than who at, at investing. But honestly, I, I don't really I don't really care too too much about it. Yeah. Um, but it's also I mean it makes sense when you think about it, should you otherwise just not put it in an ETF? Why do all the work? Yeah, just buy an S S P five hundred ETF or whatever you want to benchmark it against. But that works only when you take a capital appreciation strategy and, for instance, using the 4% rule for financial independence. We are on another strategy. We're on a dividend income strategy. So why then the only thing you need to make sure is that you, you, you realize your plan. Yeah, yeah. The, the income in my pocket doesn't care if it's beating the market or not. Um, exactly, so. exactly. It, it, it only cares whether it will grow or not. Yeah. Um, Lars has asked us, why don't you pick five to ten chowder rule stocks and stick with it uh i'm not clever enough for that because it it it, it would make me give me a bit of anxiety what if i'm wrong i can imagine like if i'm financially independent i keep that uh, portfolio as my engine and then just start really picking four or five stocks 
and building that really out over time but i don't have the guts to try and do that my my the money that i put into it that comes out of my work is is too valuable for me to to try that for me it, it gives me a feeling of increased risk even if theory says that it's probably lowering the risk it uh, gives me a, like german says an unheimlich uh, gefühl it's um quite refreshing actually to hear someone say they don't have the guts to do that you you never hear someone say that about themselves in terms of investing um but i think it's quite honest and quite refreshing it it is you have to really trust yourself as an investor to pick five even 10 stocks and and know that they're going to do reasonably well um i think that's the reason why most of us have 40 50 stocks in our portfolio we don't trust ourselves yeah. quite as much as we think we do um derek has asked us about inflation inflation and the cost of living crisis is affecting many retail stocks is it wise to be overweight in one sector like retail and then wait for it to rebound in a year or two also what do you think about target which we spoke about and dollar general as long-term plays so you know uh, this is the issue with uh, dividend investing, right? That we look at macro trends because it's what's in the news and inflation is real. Short term, it might impact companies. I think the impact of inflation has not hit the consumer yet as hard as what reality is telling us. I think COVID gave us a lot of opportunity to, to increase our savings account. And I think and I actually know of one person uh, in my private situation that cannot cover their expenses currently with their income because of inflation. Um, they are now eating up their savings, which they actually got from sitting at home during COVID. So I think it comes with a delay, this inflation. I think it will really, uh, I mean, it's the most predicted recession, right? But I, I still think it has to really hit people um yeah and where it hit i think lots of studies have been done about it but the the companies that i doubt the least about are the target and the aholts and the walmarts of this world because usually where you save money is dining out not buying this new car but just giving it a maintenance repair that that's the behavior that i see and that i also do myself so i think um, just using this peter lynch thinking I think will allow us to spot which companies are more sensitive to 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 this kind of consumer spending behavior. Yeah, I I think looking a year or two out is too short of a time frame for the retail sector in in this scenario. Where, as you said, it hasn't really quite played out as as much as I thought it would in the retail sector, and we need to find out what the new normal is. Um, yeah, we we had a period of low interest rates with with basically no inflation and. And now we went the other way so it's it's going to balance out we don't know what that level is going to mm -hmm. be and this might take three to five years to play out um, it could yeah. take it could take longer um so i think is it wise to be overweight and wait a year or two i don't know personally i don't like that strategy i have no problem if a company is fundamentally sound and you're looking three five ten years into the future thinking okay um like a target for example they are uh, financially sound I have no problem with that um, but i think one to two years is too short of a time frame to be thinking about that um Calice has asked us about 3m look we had a whole show on that i don't think we need to need to talk about that um we have a question from manny mystery and this question is about when you decided to start investing a significant part of your income and wealth did it take you some time to convince your partner that it was the right strategy for you uh, it took me no time because my wife literally doesn't care about money so she only complains when she goes to the shop and she wants to buy shoes and the cart gets rejected yeah so she trusts me fully with the money in this because our marriage is based on love we don't uh, not, not on these kinds of things of course this that might sound naive yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, because who knows what whatever happens but uh, uh at least she gets half of everything so she yeah no we're we're good here she doesn't care she's really more focused on quality of life and um she i explained to her she understands what it is about she likes it 
and and that's it yeah um yeah yeah my i have a similar situation my wife she trusts me completely i didn't have to convince her whatsoever um yeah it's quite quite straightforward yeah and then if you have a other half that is also already a little bit frugal by lifestyle or and, and i don't mean not 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 buying secondhand clothes but just generally like doesn't need to live uh, a wealthy life is not attracted by by golden necklaces and and ferraris so let's say different my wife is not materialistic yeah which which really helps here so if you have a wife or a husband that's materialistic i can imagine this is much harder um, but in my case it was really easy so many I, I i you know maybe reconsider your partner no just kidding <laughs> 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 I think there are still some people, some some women in the dividend growth investing community that might be available. We can actually do, you know, so maybe let's say different. If there is someone available in the dividend growth investing community <laughs> that's looking for a person with similar interests, <laughs> let us know. We can connect you to many mystery. And uh, yeah. <laughs> uh brilliant brilliant i love it um and then look there was there was one other question from from Flo who's asking us about certain reads again um i actually think we need to do a show on real estate investment trust because honestly we get some of these questions and i feel like i need more time to understand the company and not just not just go over the, the top line figure so i think that's one for us european dji yeah. i think we need to do a show on on different types of reads good Hey, thank you. We're at the end of the show. It was a really good one for me. I think I saved myself some troubles with the topic of this show. I know what to do now going forward. And uh, yeah, although taking a loss is never nice uh, at this part of the part of the investment journey. So, and it's not the first one, and it will definitely not be the last one. So, yeah. Thanks for yeah. that one. Let us know also what you're doing about 3M uh, if you're listening. Uh, you know where to find us on Facebook or Twitter. And see you next week again. See you all next week. Remember, both of us at Dividend Talk are not certified financial specialists through formal education. We are just two guys sharing our journey for inspiration and entertainment purposes. Hence, this is not investment advice. Although we do our best, we can't promise that the information discussed is always correct, nor appropriate for you or anybody else. We always recommend that you do your own due diligence and be accountable for your own choices. As we always say, you can't borrow conviction from others. Last but not least, by listening to our podcast, you agree to hold us harmless from any ramifications, financial or otherwise, that occur to you as a result of acting on information provided in this podcast.